name is Daniel Weinstock. I'm a professor in the Faculty of Law. Uh, I'm very happy to be hosting uh, this uh, dialogue on human rights and legal pluralism. Uh, and I'm joined today by uh, my colleagues Catherine Liu and Jacob Levy. Both uh, are members of the Center for Human Rights and Legal Pluralism. And both uh, are also professors here in the Department of Political Science. So the theme that we have been entrusted with for the day is uh, justice and pluralism. And I thought I'd get, get us started by uh, asking both uh, Jacob and uh, Catherine, and perhaps even myself, uh, if there's an event, uh, if there's a spark in your past that you can identify that got you thinking along the lines uh, that you have, that got you interested in the issues uh, that you've been uh, interested in. In my case, it's pretty uh, simple. I was an undergraduate here. I think I'm the only one of us three who has as long in a, uh, an association with uh, McGill. And, um, I took a lecture, the first university lecture I ever attended was uh, by our uh, then colleague, uh, James Tully, who lectured on Isaiah Berlin's two concepts of liberty uh, in a course called Introduction to Political Theory. And when I think about the trajectory that I've uh, undergone in 37 years, it doesn't actually feel like I've gotten that far from the kind of Berlinian pluralism, this idea that uh, human beings live uh, in a context of an irreducible pluralism of values, and that somehow there's a connection between uh, a liberal order that is respectful of human rights and the fact of uh, pluralism. But um, so. Catherine, is there something in your past that you can point to that uh, sort of got you going on the direction that you're, uh, uh, that you're in? Yes, well, without doubt, it was also my first undergraduate experience, but at the other Canadian illustrious institution, University of British Columbia, where I was part of a liberal arts program. And in that program, I remember reading ancient Greek tragedy, uh, Antigone, along with Plato's Republic. And uh, both of those, I think, stimulated, first of all, my uh, really appreciation for just how difficult that question is. You know, what is justice, right? What is it? Why is it valuable? Uh, this I, I got and certainly couldn't answer by the end of uh, the year, and, but realized that that's the question that I wanted to answer sort of intellectually for, you know, for a long time. Um, but then also reading ancient Greek tragedy showed me that there's always multiple perspectives uh, for any given story or narrative and, and claims of justice that aren't able to be, I think, uh, uh, sort of sustained by uh, the, uh, the sort of normal models of justice that we have. And so in this sense, uh, I, I found ancient Greek tragedy helpful for the pluralizing part of discussing uh, concepts like justice. Was there any point at which you thought you might you might study Greek uh, Greek tragedy, uh, Greek literature as a specialty, or is yeah. it just? No, no. I think I, I after that I I got more interested in contemporary uh, political theory. But um, just at that very start, it was what got me interested in political philosophy. Jacob, what about you? Uh, in my first research seminar in political theory, when I was an undergraduate, being taught by. Nancy Rosenblum, who later on went on to be a very important theorist of associational pluralism and group life herself, though that wasn't then what she was working on. It was just about the time that the much overwrought liberal communitarian debate of the 1980s was drawing to a close. And we read several of the pieces that, as I still think of it, helped draw it to a close including very prominently the debate between Will Kimlicka and Chandra Kukathas on so-called cultural rights in the journal Political Theory, as well as reading Wisconsin v. Yoder in that same class, the US Supreme Court case on whether the Amish had a religious liberty right not to be forced to send their children to school after age 14. And it seemed to me that there was a lot of work to do there, that the liberal communitarian debate as such looked kind of dead, but that the Kimlika Kukathas debate looked very alive. Very shortly after that, John Rawls's Political Liberalism was published and in a different kind of way oriented political theory for a good many years after that around questions of how the just liberal state was supposed to orient itself with respect to the plurality of religious and moral worldviews in society. So I spent a long time chasing down the path that more or less started with Kimlicka and Kukathas and Yoder. I then gradually added into that interest in the history of political thought and in different approaches to contemporary political theory derived from Judith Sklar and behind her Montesquieu. And Montesquieu I think of as having been one of the great theorists of pluralism in the history of political thought, and in an important way, a theorist of pluralism rather than a theory, 
theorist of justice, not a theorist of pluralism as his theory of justice. And I also became interested in how those associational and cultural liberty questions overlapped with questions about contractual and associational freedom in the market sphere and how the chemical Kukuthus debate could be overlaid with questions about the jurisdictional and jurisgenerative pluralism of what happens in a world where we can contract into different kinds of arrangements in our actions as independent legal and economic actors. Uh, and one way or another, I've kept returning to those kinds of questions throughout my research career since then. So we're pretty much onto the topic already. Um, we've been given a very broad uh, mandate. Uh, justice and pluralism, both of those words uh, could occupy us for, uh, either one could occupy us for, for hours. Uh, and their intersection is, can be understood in a multiplicity uh, of, of ways. Thinking for myself, what, what drew me to these questions when I got back to McGill after having studied uh, in the UK in the late 80s and early 90s, I got back to Montreal in the early 90s when uh, Quebec nationalism was very much on the upswing. We were just a couple of years away from uh, the 95 uh, referendum. The um, first sort of signs of what is now our 20-year uh, Quebec debate on how to accommodate religious and cultural pluralism uh, were getting started. Uh, and intellectually, it seemed like the action was around the places where the Jacob just indicated, Kim Luka's work, uh, uh, Rawls's later, uh, Rawls's later work. And but for me, it really was living in Quebec. Uh, the question really did at the end of the day uh, it was one of figuring out a way in which to justly accommodate the very diverse kinds of groups that live in this society. Linguistic groups, uh, you know, how do you combine the, uh, the claims of the Quebec majority here with the Anglophone minority, religious groups. Uh, so it was a concrete question where the pluralism part of it for me was in a way more salient than the the, the justice part. There was this obvious pluralism um, and, uh, you know, how do we accommodate it, I guess, justly, but the pluralism was the thing that, that, jumped, out at, uh, that jumped out at me. So maybe I'll, I'll start with, uh, with Catherine again. How do you, what, what, is the, what is the problematic for you? When you hear the word pluralism, what is the thing that, uh, that, that jumps out at you? What, what, uh, what is your most, uh, mm -hmm. what is the construal that, that you've been working with in your well, so I think uh, to add on to the, my answer to the previous question, also as an undergraduate, I started studying international relations. So a lot of my thinking about justice and pluralism actually occurs uh, sort of in thinking about international order and you know whether or not it accommodates the right kinds of justice uh, and, and pluralism. So I think one thing I, I'm doing in my research is looking at the modern state disorder, right, where we have a world of sovereign states uh, with rights to political independence and territorial integrity and asking well so how what kind of pluralism does this allow for or in what ways is it uh, oppressive of pluralism now I think historically in the development of international order we see that um, there were really two dominant patterns of relations between peoples um, one developed within Europe and this did eventually develop into a kind of system of tolerating pluralism or difference right so you had ter you know the idea of a sovereign state uh, within Europe at least was that um, different uh, groups could uh, order themselves internally according to their own preferences uh, without being interfered with or invaded uh, by you know, external power. So I think the, the development of international order and the sovereign state system in Europe was very much about uh, trying to accommodate pluralism, difference you know, of various kinds. Um, but of course, as uh, European powers started to expand into the rest of the world, we know that that actual principle of toleration gave way to a principle of civilization, right? So uh, people like uh, Edward Keane have written about this where the, uh, the basic uh, mode of uh, practice between European and non-European peoples was that of civilizing the other. So here, you know, you could say that um, some uh, Eurocentric ideas about justice uh, and humanity were really the, the drivers of um, the colonizing mission, right? The idea that we need to, uh, you know, take these people who are not civilized and uh, in a way civilize them, educate them, uh, govern them because they are not capable of governing themselves. So I think the problem there is when you, when you look at the construction of international order, 
it is one that has had both of these kinds of principles at play. And with decolonization, we've ended up in a world where the principle of toleration has been basically universalized, right? So we have a, a universal sovereign state system. But the problem is that there was an existing pluralism before the statist, uh, post-colonial statist order, right? And so the problem I'm interested in in some of my recent work is, is how does uh, the decolonization era of the 1960s still nevertheless entrench the structural dignity of certain societies, for example, indigenous peoples, certain pre-colonial peoples that have uh, cross-border uh, sort of relations and social patterns. So in what way does the state system still uh, nevertheless not accommodate sufficiently the, the kinds of uh, social pluralism that actually people uh, still value? So uh, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you, you, you the, to, to sort of develop, develop on that. Uh, uh, how, so, so how, what are the signs that, that we're still, in a sense, in a, in a, I guess we here in Canada have a, a very vivid sense of, 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 of why that is the case. We have indigenous populations uh, whose uh, claims to justice have not uh, yet been vindicated within the context of the Canadian state or uh, uh, indeed in, in other settler uh, societies. Uh, can you give us a sense perhaps of uh, signs of that colonial trace that despite decolonization are still present in other places that we might not have uh, sitting here in Montreal as vivid uh, mm -hmm. a sense of and that you've been uh, concerned with in your work? Um, so in, in some recent work I've been doing, you know, if you, if you look at the continent of Africa, for example, you know, geographers have uh, looked at how many uh, political boundaries in Africa, which were again drawn mainly according to uh, the colonial administrative lines, right? So, so when uh, countries became independent, they just adopted the, the previous uh, sort of borders that uh, colonial, you know, imperial colonial powers had set for them, um, and when you look at uh, geog geographically what these boundaries do, well, they, they break up about something like 177 um, cultural sort of cultural groups, right? Um, so, so one problem there is just if we are wedded to the idea of sovereignty as entailing uh, absolute control over territory and borders, um, we are in effect saying that uh, these states have no. Uh, duties to facilitate um, the cross-border uh, practices and social lives of people who have cross-border cultural lives and economic lives. And so here's one way that I think that we actually have to radically revise um, our ideas of sovereign rights over territory and border control, um, just because, in fact, it, it is a, a major source of structural injustice for at least you know, quite a lot of people who have a lot of cross-border lives. In Canada, even in, in North America, Canada, the U.S., you know, we know we have various indigenous groups that have cross-border um, member, you know, territorial claims and 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 uh, membership, um, and so building walls, for example, between the U.S. and Mexico is going to affect um, various indigenous groups that actually have cross-territorial uh, kinds of uh, either religious, cultural practices uh, or memberships, um, and even in this area, we, we see, for example, the, the Mohawk and various other members of the Iroquois Confederacy that they all have cross-border. Order, um, sort of uh, social lives and practices. And so the question is, how does a sovereign state system deal with that? And to the extent that it doesn't, uh, then you can say that that is one way that a sovereign state order actually does an injustice to uh, certain sets of people. It doesn't allow them to be self-determining in ways because of uh, the hegemonic control of, of uh, states over borders. So we're all, all three of us. One thing that, that connects us, uh, aside from having worked together in various contexts for, for years, is that we're all normative political theorists. We want to understand the way the world works, but we also want to understand the way in which uh, to make it better. And uh, so, Catherine, you've pointed to a fact. I mean, anybody who looks at the map of Africa can see that there are just too many straight lines uh, for, it, for, the, for those to have emerged organically on the basis of actually existing uh, uh, cultures. There's obviously a kind of a, a geographical and therefore cultural violence uh, that jumps up, jumps out at us when we look at a continent like like Africa. But now, putting on your hat as a so, in a way, you are pointing towards a, a, a set of facts that call for some kind of remedy, that call for some kind of uh, you know improvement. As normative political theorists, what are the directions? I mean, the state system seems so deeply entrenched, and those borders, despite their artificiality, seem so deeply entrenched that uh, it, it seems it seems that to point to the problem does not necessarily mean that the solution is to undo them. What are the kinds of things that, in terms of uh, uh, you know, g giving realistic uh, sort of um, uh, remedies to the kinds of problems that you've uh, 
uh, talked about? What are the kinds of things that you look at in your work? Yeah, so one thing I should emphasize is I, I don't recommend trying to redraw borders. So right. in a way, I don't think it matters where the line is drawn. So all these you know disputes we have about uh, where to draw the line, I, I think are the lines are going to be arbitrary almost no matter where you draw them. So the, the point is not to redraw the lines. The more the, the point is more to limit and check and, and recondition what power states have to control movement and of people and goods and, and various other things uh, across borders, right? So I think if we had a, a more... Uh, um, if we limited uh, state rights with respect to that kind of movement, we would be able to accommodate many of these concerns. For example, do, you know, the fact that for, uh, members of uh, the Mohawk uh, Nation do not need passports in order to traverse the U.S.-Canada border. You know, this is something that it is institutionalized, but you know, to the extent that that is recognized is important then for facilitating uh, indigenous um, rights in international relations. Um, I think the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is a really good uh, document to look at and see what sorts of things could be required in, in the way of implementation and reform. None of the things require something like uh, changing state sovereignty to the, to the point of eliminating states, but it does require states to recognize their duties with respect to um, border control, education, natural resource uh, control, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So these are reforms that can be made. Um, but I, I, I'm glad that you pointed that out, that the point is not to uh, you know, redo the map of Africa, right? I, I, although you know, um, African politicians have uh, theorized this in the decolonization era, I think Nkrumah did think about having a, a pan-African um, you know, unity and, and not accepting the borders. If, well, Jacob. Uh, if we don't think that it's a demand of justice to have open borders, um, by which I mean not only very, very uh, substantially increased freedom of movement, but actually the abolition of papers at the borders. Uh, and I'm not committed to thinking that one way or the other, but if one doesn't think that, then does it follow that those cross-border regions just move the hard lines a little bit, such that in order to protect the freedom of movement of people on Mohawk land across the Canadian US border, that Mohawk land will have harder borders around it to prevent in migration of non Mohawk Canadians and Americans who would then use the open border as a free passageway? No, so I'm actually thinking about it not in terms of just what is considered Mohawk land. I think I, I'm also thinking about it in terms of the rights of members of the Mohawk Nation to travel between these two countries for purposes of work, even not on their land. So when you think about iron workers, apparently uh, from the Mohawk communities here, they often travel to New York, you know, to, to work there. Um, and so that's not necessarily on Mohawk land, but it is about the rights of indigenous members to travel. Um, in in, in um, British Columbia, actually, this, this uh, court case happened recently where uh, a member of the six nation, I think, uh, who basically was living in the U.S., um, crossed the Canadian border into B.C. Uh, and, and shot a moose. And then he was fined for it because he didn't have, like, all the state registrations, you know. Uh, but he basically could claim, well, you know, the Six Inch Nation actually had, you know, traditional hunting practices that spanned the U.S.-Canadian border. And as a member of that nation, you know, I'm still entitled to do this. Um, so in, in this sense, I think it's not necessarily tied to uh, the land claims of, of uh, Mohawk or any indigenous nation. It's, it's more about as members of nations that have cross-border activities of some kind, whether it's now modernized work in, in terms of iron work or whether it's traditional hunting practices. I think the question is, you know, how of justice is uh, to what extent the state can recognize those claims to uh, continue um, or, or to make new uh, practices based on their historical cross-border um, claims. So I want to move over to Jacob in a second, but I, I want to uh, perhaps uh, just summarize uh, uh, maybe a little bit uh, too, uh, too coarsely and bluntly to really capture all of the uh, nuance of all of your work. Uh, you've talked about justice now, but it sounds like one of the main drivers uh, of your work is a concern with injustice, and in particular with uh, uh, centuries-long injustice of uh, colonialism, both here in, in Canada and North America, but also uh, 
uh, internationally, and that the kind of pluralism that jumps out at you when the word pluralism is is uh, is, is evoked is a pluralism of cultural groups, a pluralism of cultural groups whose lives were uh, interrupted uh, by. Uh, the political, not just the the sort of civilization, civilizing uh, sort of imperative that uh, colonialism uh, used to justify its incursions into uh, other people's uh, uh, lands, but also the the political structures uh, that uh, were left there, uh, even when that mission sort of was seen for what it, we now see it to be. Uh, so it's a question of, um, of 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 trying to provide cultural groups that were done violence to uh, with some kind of political means with which to undo the injustices of co colonialism. That yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a good way to, to, to pick up on what I'm interested in. Um, and I use a lot the concepts uh, of Iris Marin Young, as you know, uh, with respect to structural injustice. And, you know, she explained how structural injustice is uh, not necessarily about individuals willfully violating, you know, specific rules and laws, uh, but, but about how they produce certain kinds of objectionable relations and, and uh, conditions, um, you know, going on their normal state of affairs, right? Um, so in a way, I'm saying, yeah, that the system that we all take for granted, the, the sort of sovereign state order, is, is in a way something that, that actually reproduces structural injustices that come from the colonial times. It's not so much that we can really undo um, historical colonial injustice anymore. So I, I'm not saying that we can undo them. But I do think that we should recognize the, the degree and extent to which we actually reproduce those colonial practices and, and injustices to the extent that we continue to perpetuate uh, certain political structures that still uh, are oppressive in the, in the ways that uh, they historically have been, right? So, so I'm into the obligation of contemporary agents to address and redress the contemporary structural injustices that are, in a way, reproducing um, certain types of injustices that originated, perhaps, in, in a colonial period. Jacob, when you hear those two words, justice and pluralism, how do you view their intersection? Hearing Catherine talk about it drove home to me how complementary in some respects um, our approaches are because my orientation in my work is primarily, is overwhelmingly on domestic constitutional orders. Uh, and even my interest in the emergence of the early modern European state, the sovereign Weberian state, is not primarily on the state system in the international face of sovereignty, but on consolidation of unifying, centralizing state authority over a pre-existing plurality of jurisdictions and associations and groups on, in European society. Uh, I'm interested in how many different groups and associations and memberships and institutions free people really end up having duties to, loyalties to, attachments to, sets of rules that they follow and live by, and the mismatch between that fact of our pluralistic group life and the juridical and philosophical claim of the Weberian sovereign state in its domestic inward looking face to be the ultimate final arbiter of all normative social questions. There are some approaches, and there have been some approaches since early modernity and the onset of social contract theory, that treat justice as the thing that the state decides. And say, pluralism might be a social fact, but it's a social fact that must be tamed by and subordinated to the justice that is what the state plans out. I've gradually come to doubt even that very much. I did start at a position kind of like that coming out of the Rawlsian debates and just trying to shift the Rawlsian debates somewhat more in the direction of more generous accommodation for the just liberties of the subordinated groups. I now start to think that state authority ought to be seen as one of the emergent facts out of complicated social orders and social processes, and not one that is philosophically utterly other than the other kinds of normative claims that are put by other groups in a society. Insofar as we get justice in a pluralistic social order, 
I suspect that it has emergent properties, not planned properties. There are ways in which the balances of different groups, their abilities to make certain kinds of claims stick, as well as the ways in which they uh, provide opportunities for individual members of a social order to sometimes exit, sometimes migrate, sometimes strategically play one membership off against another, start to generate a need for rights claims and legal structures in the background or, or, or umbrella legal order that we talk about with the more familiar language of political philosophy as being a just or unjust state of affairs. But even if we use the word just and unjust primarily about that background state of affairs, that doesn't mean that it's the background state of affairs that creates it or brings it into being in the way that the social contract tradition out of which John Rawls arises uh, or certain kinds of very aggressive legal positivism would sometimes imagine that justice is the set of decisions that we make consciously and deliberately, whereas pluralism is the stuff that happens in this other organic, quasi-natural, non-agentic way. Um, I'm currently pushing harder and harder against that sharp dichotomy. So let me, let me uh, we're, we're right at the heart of, in a way, uh, what the Center for Human Rights and Legal Pluralism uh, does, which some people might think of as somewhat oxymoronic. Uh, you either have, and to, to, to push that oxymoron, not necessarily in my own voice, but uh, uh, you know, in the voice of someone who might look at it from the outside, uh, you either have human rights or you have pluralism. You can't have both. Um, this constitutionalism, which you talked about at the beginning, is about uh, making sure that everybody across uh, territory has the same rights. Uh, that groups can't uh, use the fact of their groupness in order to deny people within certain rights or to make those rights dependent upon structures of that group rather than of uh, the, the, larger, the larger society. So there's a it's kind of a Whiggish, optimistic story about the rationality of the state as opposed to the kind of randomness uh, of uh, association, be it religious association, familial, you know, the whole mess of association that's out there. Uh, the state has a role of uh, making sure that without erasing those associations, uh, those associations are not the source of the kinds of inequalities that we might want uh, to, to worry about. And if I could connect a little bit the, uh, the two, you know, the thing that we feel we it's hard to do at the international level, in other words, having a kind of international government that could um, homogenize the kinds of rights that people can, not just in theory, but in practice, actually claim. The Viberian control of the state makes it the case that at least within the state, we can have that. So why is that picture wrong? Or is it wrong? It, 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 it's, it is fully wrong. It is fully wrong. It That's is fully wrong. Um, it, it, it combines elements of ideology and fantasy and lie. Uh, and I should say that because of that, it's not one that I'm claiming for myself. <laughs> I'm just giving expression to it. Um, it. It's useful for my purposes that you introduced an idea like rationality or rationalism into that account of it. Thank you for the setup um, in, in my book, Rationalism, Pluralism, and Freedom, Oxford University Press 2015, uh, I, I characterize two traditions of thinking about how complex social orders uh, can generate something like a liberal freedom for individual persons. And one of them I characterize with the rationalistic tradition. You summarized it pretty well, the sentiment that says, because the state is up to us to decide, that's where we can take our ideas of justice and rights and implement them on top of a social order that is otherwise not subject to moral, morally agentic, deliberate decision. But states are facts in the world. And it's simply not the case that when we moralize at states, we philosophers, we theorists, we normative thinkers, we bring the normative thing into existence any more than is true for our status as members of universities, cities, provinces, religions, churches, cultural groups, associations, corporations, whatever. All of those are sites of normative contestation. All of those are places in which members make normative arguments about better and worse things to happen. The state is not somehow methodologically outside that system. What is true is that since the consolidation of state power, 
there have been ideas that I think consolidated into being ideologies justifying and legitimating state power in the name of something like a rational, rationalism and rationality of deliberate decision and justice. Constitutionalism was in an important way a tradition on the pluralist side of that divide. Constitutionalism was the tradition of saying the, the absolute monarchs of early modernity are not entitled to be the sole lawgivers and the unique sources of normativity within their societies. What Montesquieu referred to as the corps intermediaire, the intermediate bodies of the ancient constitutional order in Europe the provinces, the cities, the universities, the guilds, the church, they have their rights, they have their associational freedom that goes into being part of the fundamental law of a complicated social order. And then the American Constitution was, well, it was a federal constitution. It was not a constitution that purported to abolish all of the intermediate orders, in this case the states that go into the United States. It's only with the French Revolution that we start to see the emergence of an idea of constitutionalism that is what you described, where really what it is to have a constitution is to sit down and make all our decisions at once and treat the whole of the social order as a thing that we could decide in a unified, deliberate, one moment in time way. And the fact that the French Revolutionary State then had to go so aggressively to war with the actual pluralism within French society seems to be importantly revelatory about the limits of that style of constitutional thinking and the merits of the older pluralist liberal way of thinking about constitutional orders. There's never going to be a moment where we are able to simply decide once and for all, aha, now let's have justice. And thinking that there will be such a moment leads us to over-desire freedom of state action and underappreciate the associational liberty and the cultural liberty and the freedom of pluralistic groups within social orders because we, we imagine the state doing only right things. We say, well, if the state only did right things, then why would we possibly leave any plurality out in the various other jurisgenerative legal orders in society? But we shouldn't start by imagining that the state will only do right things and that the alternative to state action is therefore permission to do wrong things at other levels. That's not how social orders work. So I want to ask both of you. Oh, no, Catherine, do you yeah, no, I mean, I think I, we have to bring something else in, into the picture, which is um, that that may very well be true from a kind of historical perspective. And of course, it's important, I think, to be critical of how states have actually you know, developed in, in history and, and sociologically. But you know, I think one thing that we haven't brought in is why it is important to allow um, pluralism to develop in a way that uh, is more consistent with justice, let's say, the demands of justice. Because we all recognize that certainly there are certain kinds of uh, plural, pluralism that, that are outside of what anyone would consider to, to be just or justified. Um, and, and I think that's why I'm interested in problems of justice and reconciliation in world politics, which is actually the title of my forthcoming book from Cambridge University Press this October. Um, and, and that's the problem of alienation. So it seems to me that, um, let's say, that in fact there is a better way, there is a more just social political structure that we could be aiming towards, right? Um, now, the question is how does that, how do we arrive at, at such a condition or order? And it seems to me that one of the lessons of, of international history is that you know you might have some ideas about justice, um, but you know, you're, if you alienate the agents who are supposed to appropriate it and develop it, um, that's going to lead to usually counterproductive consequences, right? So, so I, I think of the problem of colonialism not only as one about injustice, you know, clearly uh, violating self-determination or committing genocide or uh, you know doing all sorts of moral wrongs, um, but to the extent that there there might have been practices that were in a way. Uh, possibly productive, they were undermined by the fact that they were alienating. They were imposed in certain ways that didn't allow agents uh, who might have been part of an unjust social structure to be able to appropriate those processes of uh, rethinking and, and reorienting their social practices. So I, I think that that's a fundamental problem. And, and I think for that reason, um, pluralism is, is important, or at least um, sufficient recognition of 
this problem of freedom, the agent's subjective freedom to be authors of their social world, and how then that affects, I think, the way that we, we think about um, how any agent, powerful or weak, uh, can uh, actually promote justice in social relations. You started answering the question that I wanted to ask both of you, and, uh, but I want to I push back against uh, Jacob, having lobbed the softball of rationalism at you. Mm -hmm. I want to I, I I perhaps uh, ask you a slightly more difficult uh, question about the, uh, the picture of the relationship between the state and the various normative orders that are present in an even minimally complex society. Uh, a slightly more difficult way of, of, of addressing that, which has to do with another way of thinking about justice that hasn't been on the table so far in our discussion this morning, uh, which, for lack of a better term, I'll call distributive justice. Uh, so the, 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 the bogeyman, or one of the bogeymen um, in standing in the way of viewing your picture as totally attractive, is uh, what one might call the Northern League temptation. In other words, um, affluent groups within society saying, hey, we have a culture, and perhaps sometimes you know, it's, it's, that, that claim um, is easily debunkable when it's a made-up culture, but the problem is sometimes it isn't. Sometimes there are actually organically uh, derived cultures that also map on to huge disparities and inequalities. So one of the things that the state might be able to claim, and I'd be curious to uh, hear from you about this, forget about rationalism, for be, forget about being the embodiment of rationalism, being the embodiment of solidarity, being the embodiment of a certain way, both because of the scale that it commands and also because of the ability that it has to treat all of its citizens as equals, notwithstanding their particular uh, affiliations, of being able to instantiate a certain kind of uh, distributional uh, solidarity, which will make it the case that when a Northern League or Northern League type entity decides that it wants to go it alone, there is something to pull back against that. So I'd be curious to hear you react to that different kind of way of speaking for the state. Uh, I'll, I'll make the question even sharper and harder for myself okay. before I stumble through an answer. Uh, <laughs> the, the distinction you offered at the beginning between it could be bad faith, but often it will reflect something that is plausibly true at the level of culture. Uh, genuine inequalities, genuine economic inequalities that are then also productive of social inequalities in a variety of ways, they will tend to build culture around them. And so even something that started off being nothing other than an inequality of resources will, people who have very different lives will start to attach different normative importance, different customs, different habits to those material differences. And so we, we, we could even imagine, I think, a relatively monocultural social order in which an economic event intervened, creating uh, not, not a class difference in the sense of there being an intermixture of rich and poor all in the same place, but if, say, you got a regional break in a richer and a poorer region. Um, and after a couple of generations, it wouldn't feel like a monocultural place anymore. And we, we're, we can't essentialize culture and say, ah, oh, well, that's the original primitive thing that can therefore forevermore justify whatever one wants. Um, that said, I don't think that the nation state as bearer of solidarity has primal moral importance either. There are genuine moral claims of sufficiency, and there are some claims having to do with shared citizenship that can justify something more than a demand of sufficiency. But the nation state isn't the origin of, say, social wealth any more than the region or the culture is the origin of social wealth. In important ways, the origins of social wealth are very much larger than particular nation states. And when particular nation states claim, aha, this wealth is ours, where ours means the citizenry of the nation state, when uh, Barack Obama famously says, you didn't build that, having as the implied claim, therefore the residual claim resides in Washington, D.C. with respect to the United States. Well, Washington, D.C. didn't build it either. There's an important way in which everyone born into a society like the United States or Canada, um, who is an inheritor of the part of those social orders that is very wealthy. So here, setting aside the degree to which the, the wealth of those social orders is built on expropriation of indigenous peoples who are outside the inheritance of the wealth. 
But those who are inheritors of the wealth are not inheritors of somehow distinctively American or Canadian wealth. They're inheritors of broad processes in that arose out of Northern and Western Europe and then spread to a great deal of Western Europe and then spread to more and more of the world um, to which the particular nation state isn't in any important way the key decisive agent or even meaningfully the representative. So the nation state can sometimes say, we are the locally efficacious agent to ensure sufficient sufficiency on material conditions. Doesn't make it a good stand-in for this other thing such that I'm willing to really panic about the thought that there will be more than one entity, more than one social level within a social order that falsely claims the wealth belongs to this group rather than that group. Wealth doesn't, in that sense, belong to any of them. And I think we need to conduct our arguments about distributive justice and about um, justice in the economic sphere meaningfully independently of deciding which is really the group that has the fundamental claim on it. We, we want to worry about the well-being of persons. But are you saying then that questions about distributive justice are necessarily global in the contemporary That's circumstances of politics? Sounded like that to me. It did, didn't yeah. it? Uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't think that they can ever be, uh, I don't think the global level can be methodologically excluded mm -hmm. in the way that the nation state solidarity story demands. and that's one of the reasons why I think the nation state solidarity story <coughs> is objectionable too. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't mean the globe then becomes, as it were, the stand-in for the thing that the nation state was asserting. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where, where wealth has emerged from and what contributes to the ongoing status of poverty, those aren't either, um, as it were, the decision of a unified global community. Mm -hmm. They weren't decisions in that sense and they arose out of processes that we have to grapple with as really complicated overlapping processes. That's true. Oh. I was going to take us in a different direction, but. Oh, well, actually, so just to continue on this, um, so I've been interested in these questions about wealth and poverty with respect to redressing colonialism, right? So obviously one of the major uh, questions in, in this uh, discussion now is whether or not there should be reparations mm -hmm. for uh, you know, the un economic underdevelopment of uh, previously colonized peoples. And, and it's a very tricky question, I think, because exactly of what you're saying is when, when you think about how countries are doing now, can you actually attribute this in a kind of linear automatic way as an automatic effect of past injustice? And, and I argue that really you can't, right? Um, but because there are so many agents involved, and one of the agents is actually the domestic state, right? So to yeah. what extent does the domestic state implement certain kinds of policies that uh, perhaps produce contemporary inequalities? So whatever happened in the past, um, you know, it, it may not at all have a kind of linear automatic uh, sort of, uh, you know, resonance today. Take a country like China. China suffered from a hundred years of unequal treaties with mainly European powers. But if you looked at China in the late 1950s and the Great Leap Forward, it's very difficult to say that the Great Leap Forward was a product of you know, European uh, unequal treaties, right? Obviously, it was much more a product of Mao's uh, economic policies and problems of trying to implement Stalinist agrarian uh, policies. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, after uh, Mao gave up that policy and Deng Xiaoping implemented other much more practical, you could say, economic policies, uh, you know, China's uh, growth factor just uh, skyrocketed, right? So from about the mid-1980s on, um, China was able to lift 500 million people out of poverty. Uh, you know, the poverty rate went from 65% to 10% of the population. Um, and, and you could say, well, there the domestic agent really matters a lot, right? Right. So, yes, there are international uh, problems of, of global uh, justice with respect to um, the processes of the global economy. Um, but the state, to the extent that it has agency, still also uh, can radically affect the life chances of mm -hmm. the people within its territory and under its control. Right? And, and China, I think, is a, is a very obvious case. Now, of course, when economic historians look at the growth of China, they would say, well, it's not something that the Chinese did alone. They could only do this because they were able to participate and integrate in a certain kind of global economic structure that had also been evolving you know, from the 1980s on. Right? So in that sense, I think no countries, uh, you know, whether they, they recover from a terrible uh, system uh, or past, um, 
or don't recover. In a way, you know, there's always a domestic and a kind of a global component to how well they do, right? And and then the problem of justice is okay, figuring out well, what are the the kinds of uh, regulative structures you need at the global level uh, to control the flow of global capitalism and its practices and its agents, and then what do you need at the domestic level that would also help to support those, right? And and I think this is a a major question um, with respect to things like distributive justice. So I think I agree with Jacob in a sense that. And that it's no longer just a domestic issue, um, but I, I also think though that that one of the one of the main uh, agents of justice is the state in terms of affecting the the distribution within a within a state to the extent that we still have a state system. I, I think it is still important uh, for states to. Um, to have good economic distributive justice policies because they really do matter, whatever the global state of affairs might be with respect to economic justice. So I want to throw out a question that I think, in a way, I'm going to try to make a, a, a bright red thread between uh, your two sets of concerns and see how you would uh, react to it. In a sense, there is a commonality of structure in both of your arguments, which basically I'm going to caricature it grossly right now for the sake of rhetorical sort of effect, and then we can nuance it. But the 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 the, the gross caricature is um, there was some the, the, the culture was happening, rich associational life uh, of churches, uh, universities, uh, municipalities, etc. All these undisturbed cultures in parts of the world um, th th that you were talking about, Catherine, and then capital S, capital B, something bad happened, capital H. Um, in Jacob's case, and again, I'm, I'm French. Rationalistic <laughs> constitutionalism happened, um, and uh, in your case, Catherine, colonialism happened. And it would be actually interesting to think about the the, the connection between those two bads because there certainly uh, are one. Now, the, the the question, the the challenge that I want to throw out to both of you is, those bads had effects. Um, not just in creating injustices, but also in creating identities. Uh, my wife, who you both know, uh, works on missionaries uh, as uh, sort of reluctant agents of, uh, reluctant or, you know, as ambiguous agents of colonialism. Now, um, the places that the missionaries went to, along with the colonial powers, missionized millions of people around the globe who are now whatever denomination of Christian happened to have uh, arrived, arrived there. Those identities are now uh, part of who they are. And indeed, even the state identities, as, conflict, as, conflict, as in conflict as they are with the kinds of trans-border uh, phenomena that you uh, mentioned, have given rise to national identities. Mm -hmm. And in a similar way, um, there are now French, well, France is, you know, there are, there are French citizens. Uh, there, are, there, there is a, not just an external, violently perceived, but also an internalized trace of the kinds of things, Jacob, that you were talking about. Um, the, 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 the nation building, the, the myth, even if it is a myth, of a nation state that is the embodiment of reason and of welfare, uh, et cetera, even if it starts off as a myth, has an impact. And so um, you know, there's, there's a direction that both of you might be interpreted as going in, which I don't think either one of you wants to go in, which is kind of a nostalgia. If only we could undo the sins of the past and go back to the way things were before. Um, so I don't think that either one, one of you wants to walk down that road. But so how does your project get complicated by the fact that those bads actually had in, internalized effects as opposed to just being perceived as violences? I think we both rejected stories of the fall. Um, they're, they're stories of processes. They're stories that deny the claim of um, the unique moral elevation that is the moment of the European civilizing colonial process bringing rationality to the world or the early modern Weberian state bringing rationality and justice to the world. Um, they're moments of historicizing uh, and putting into the context of, well, it, those were just more things that happened. And there were injustices associated with them, but there were injustices associated with all of the processes that we're talking about all along. And we are always heir to really complicated patterns of non-essentialist, non-natural, but true, true in people's psychological and sociological identities, uh, true identities, true group, true group loyalties, true associations and institutions, and all the rest. Uh, 
I think that it's the views that Catherine and I are rejecting that try to have it too easy and try to look at there being unique moments in time that get us out of just the world of ongoing process. Catherine, does that? Yeah, I'm very anti-nostalgic. Um, one of the things I do in my work is to show how structural injustices also exist in local practices and how they often get instrumentalized by structural injustices that come from outside, right? So when you think about slavery, right, the fact that um, some of the groups in the Congo practice slavery made it possible for Europeans to basically change that into a much more brutal system, right? Um, in the case of uh, the Korean and women who were uh, forcibly um, um, enlisted into sexual uh, forced labor and slavery in, through Japanese imperialism. Um, when you look at the actual victims of that practice, it was mostly poor rural working class uh, Korean women. Why did that pattern happen? Well, partly because there were these class, uh, you know, in injustices within Korean society that made the poor r rural working class women more subject to this kind of practice than, than elite women. So I'm arguing that, in fact, uh, most colonial injustices actually require quite a lot of collaboration and cooperation between elites within colonized societies as well as the colonizer, and that this actually really complicates a kind of interactional idea of settling accounts for colonialism and requires us to look at much more, I think, transnational and, and non-state-based uh, ways of thinking about structural injustice. Um, but with respect to indigenous people, so. I'm not arguing necessarily that uh, you know pre-colonial groups uh, sort of exist, you know, and and uh, that we can somehow return. Uh, obviously, the problem of cultural disruption and really genocide is that um, indigenous peoples face this huge problem of. Uh, having had their entire socialization processes um, destroyed, right, language acquisition, so on. So that's why we do see now the movement of indigenous resurgence, which is about exactly trying to revitalize those processes of socialization by which indigenous peoples can actually be indigenous peoples in the modern world. How they creatively resolve this problem is, is obviously up to them. Um, I think the state has to make room for that. And I do think that, you know, one hopeful thing we can remember is, is that, you know, in the 19th century, um, as indigenous peoples were being destroyed, um, you know, there were thoughts that actually they would be completely um, extinct, right? So, so there was a plan to build a monument to the Red Indian um, that William Taft, the US president, was involved in because they thought that there literally would be no Red Indians left, right? Now, the amazing thing is, in fact, of course, they did not die, right? So, so in fact, there are still indigenous peoples. Um, that's not being nostalgic. That's just saying that these people have gone through incredible destruction and, and still uh, managed to, to revive and have a sense of uh, in, indigeneity. So the question then is, how do we have a political order that actually allows that to happen? And here, I don't think that it's enough to say that, well, indigenous people should just work it out with the settler colonial state into which they've been forcibly incorporated. I mean, they've tried that, but they're constantly running up against problems. And I think one of the major problems is that um, their status as peoples in the international order still has not been recognized. So I think the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples shows how much that struggle is actually an international struggle, right? How um, the fact that um, you know, they showed up at the League of Nations, for example, to petition their unjust treatment by Canada was really an international issue that should have been addressed and not just seen as a kind of unil a sort of bilateral problem between Canada or between the British and, and uh, indigenous peoples. I think that kind of recognition is what would actually fortify um, the changing, the, the real transformation of the uh, state order into one that can accommodate groups that have suffered um, these kinds of uh, practices um, but have still maintained uh, a sense of identity and, and also social agency. Um, so in that sense, I don't think I'm being nostalgic. I'm just like looking at the reality of uh, the trends in international conflict, which have led to things like indigenous transnational movements and also the UN declaration. So I think we're coming to the, towards the end of, of, our, of our time. Uh, sur surprisingly uh, enough, uh, it doesn't feel like we've been uh, talking for an hour. Uh, but maybe I'll, I'll, I'll as, a, as a final envoi, uh, I'll ask both of you uh, another question. So another thing that uh, connects your work, despite the fact that it is on the face of it, 
very different uh, uh, topics, very different, uh, uh, you know, you're looking at very different um, uh, human communities. Um, you're both uh, very much uh, theorists for whom history and facts matter. Um, so there's a kind of political theorizing that, uh, that we are all familiar with, uh, that some of us uh, might be more guilty of than others, uh, which is kind of desert island thinking, right? Uh, shipwrecked uh, uh, people arrive upon a desert island and they have to make justice from the ground up uh, using auctions and things like that, no particular person uh, being referred to here. And that is very much not your style of, of thinking, either one of you. Um, now, the weakness of the kind of theorizing that I've just talked about is that it is completely anhistorical and, uh, in a way, a contextual. The strength of it, you know, that you might you might appeal to as a philosopher or as a theorist is that it allows you for robust normative theorizing. You know, we can think about justice unperturbed by the sort of messiness of of the real world. You are still both normative political theorists for whom the facts don't exhaust. It's not just a question of just mm -hmm. accounting for what happened. This happened, then that happened, and it was a mixture of good and bad, and something else will certainly happen that will be a mixture of good and bad, and I'm just going to chronicle it. I guess. My, the final question that I'd like to ask both of you is, given your methodological uh, commitments to facts mattering, to history ma mattering, how does that not crowd out the theorizing? Where is the moment for kind of normative theorizing in both of your works? I think you've spoken about it en passant, both of you, but I'd like both of you perhaps to conclude with thinking about that methodological point. Catherine, you want to start off on? Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, I, I actually, I'm, somebody who has always loved um, history, reading history, but I found, especially as I got into the literature, the philosophical literature about um, historic injustice, redressing historic injustice, uh, reparations, uh, and especially about international um, rectificatory justice, I was just astounded that um, the way that philosophers make up examples, like state A colonized state B, therefore state A has reparative obligations to state B. This is kind of the, the general way that, you know, uh, I won't name anyone, but people talk about uh, redressing colonialism in the philosophical literature. And I guess it, it, it so did not accord with basically what I understood history, like the actual historical processes of colonialism to have been and the actual colonial injustices to have been. But I thought, how can you have a plausible normative theory about redressing colonialism if it's completely inconsistent with the actual historical cases of colonialism? So it's, it seems to me that if you want an action guiding theory about you know, redressing colonialism, surely since it was an actual historical process and, and case that, that, or several cases, that, that you actually need a normative theory that guides you towards redressing the actual case as opposed to some hypothetical case. And then I think also more disturbingly, the problem with, uh, I think, some contemporary political theorists working on global justice, including rectificatory justice, um, is the status presumptions behind their theories. And this, to me, actually is totally obscuring a whole different category of injustice that comes with colonialism, right? So just having a kind of a statist uh, premise, which I think political theorists adopt to try to make their theories more realistic, actually, um, in fact, per perpetrates or, or perpetuates, um, I think, a, a deep structural injustice uh, of the international order, which is completely obscured because they adopt those status premises. So this was ultimately my motivation in, in uh, examining these issues and, and really taking history seriously. But, you know, as you, as you say, um, I, I look at the historical um, story and, and basically try to do a normative analysis. You know, what are the problems generated by the actual history? So to me, the, the, the actual problems are the structural injustices that actually uh, transcend the colonizer-colonized divide. So how do we think about redressing that kind of structural injustice? It's quite a different problem than if you just pretend that the injustices were just between one state versus another state. Jacob? Both Catherine and I owe some intellectual debts to Judith Schlar, with whom we both intended to study before she died, uh, who told theorists as a methodological matter to put injustice first. And we also both owe intellectual debts to the late Irish Marion Young, who was my colleague for a long time and whose substantive work in theorizing very much did put injustice first. Uh, more or less following Adam Smith on where our moral knowledge comes from, I deny that desert island theorizing has the epistemic virtues that are claimed for it. The, the imagined desert island never is the Archimedean point. It's a place from which uh, 
some of the histories of injustice that teach us about the moralized concepts will get more or less obscured. So in Catherine's example, uh, when I do my desert island theorizing about my desert island colonizing another desert island, I'm imagining something about what that verb to colonize is. I'm importing a bunch of history that then I hide mm. by not being willing to attach proper nouns to it. And then I'm acting as if the thinking about justice, the thinking about the ideal part, is again liberated from the background knowledge of what injustice is like that is actually informing it. Um, I think that a great deal of our moral learning in and out of politics comes from thinking about wrongs and wrongdoings and responses to wrongdoings, and that we kind of evolve a body of thought about justice out of that. Uh, that means that getting the history more or less careful, more or less right, and being attentive to the complexity of injustice, that has epistemic advantages over uh, Im imagining the history away and acting as if we can start off by thinking about what the right thing to do is. Then, the other problem of the desert island theorizing, I absolutely agree with Catherine, is how statist it methodologically ends up being. Because once I've imagined, well, here's what justice would demand in our auction on the shore. Well, now let's imagine an agency that will make justice and we'll call that agency state. But as we've both been emphasizing, that the states are things with histories and dynamics and processes of their own. And it just won't do as a way of thinking about political normativity to take one of the central institutions of political life and imagine that what it is they stand in for doing justice. Catherine, Jacob, thank you very much.